uh, we're going to give a couple more minutes for people who are might be running a little bit late to uh, get into the webinar. We've got a pretty good attendance, but I think we can, there's probably some other people that we want to include. So hang in there with us. We're just about ready to go. So it looks to me like things are tapering off a bit, so let's get started. Good day, everyone, and welcome to this LIDAR News educational webinar entitled Advantages and Challenges of a Multi-Sensor 3D Data Fusion Strategy, sponsored by Regal. My name is Gene Rowe. I am the founder of LIDAR News. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to attend today's webinar. As I'm sure you are aware, we're taking on a challenging topic. Unfortunately, we do not have the time to address all of the issues involving data fusion, but I think we have some important information and best practices that you'll be able to immediately take advantage of. Before we start the presentations, I'd like to make sure everyone is properly connected. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface panel that you should be seeing in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Slide it out if it is docked using the red arrow. You have two audio options to choose from, computer audio or by calling in via phone call. To switch between the two, just click on the circle next to your preferred audio option. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, we'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And uh, we have a few more items under the heading of, in case you are wondering. I'm gonna give you a few moments to read through these. Let us know if you have any questions via the question box and we'll do our best to help. If all else fails, please use your invitation to reconnect or perhaps use a different browser. In a worst case, we will be providing you with a full recording. I'd like to briefly introduce you to today's speakers. As I mentioned, my name is Gene Rowe, founder of LiDAR News and MPN Components. I'm celebrating 50 years as a consulting civil engineer in the surveying and mapping field. I'm currently the chair of the ASTM E57 committee that developed the widely adopted 3D Data Interoperability Standard E57. Robert Dannenberg is the Director of Unmanned Aviation at Maser Consulting. He is charged with the development and expansion of remote piloted aircraft system services, as well as the firm's data fusion capabilities, specifically by combining remote sensing technologies to employ a more holistic approach for clients. Mylin Trong is the UAS ULS Segment Manager at Regal USA. Ms. Trong has been with Regal USA since 2010, where she previously held the position of Training and Support Manager for Kinematic Systems. Ms. Trong holds a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Central Florida. We will have two short polls. I will introduce some of the key issues involving multi-sensor 3D data fusion with an emphasis on mobile mapping systems, which generally can include both manned, such as on a vehicle, or unmanned, such as a drone-based platform. 
Rob Dannenberg is going to provide a more in-depth presentation of the real world issues he and his team have encountered in the practical application of multi-sensor data fusion on two interesting projects. My Lin Trong has recorded a video demonstrating the use of Regal's Rye Process software to process multi-sensor LiDAR data, which she will narrate. And then we'll wrap things up with our key takeaways, followed by, I think we'll have at least 10 to 15 minutes left over for questions. Okay, let's start with poll number one, Jill. This will give us an idea of where you are with the use of multi-sensor 3D data fusion. Hello, everybody. So the first poll is a getting ready to be launched, which is how experienced are you with multi-sensor 3D data fusion? So if you guys don't mind, if you guys would please fill in the poll in the next about, you know, 15 to 20 seconds, we're asking what is your level of expertise and experience with data fusion projects? Please select one, beginner, intermediate, or expert. So we will give this about five more seconds and then we will show the results of the poll. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close that poll and show you guys where we're at. So we are at, sorry, bear with me one moment. We are at 54% as beginner, 36% intermediate and 11% as expert. Thank you guys very much. Yes, thanks. That gives us a, a pretty good idea that uh, I think we're going to be hitting the sweet spot with this overall webinar. So humans are undoubtedly the most powerful example of the ability to fuse data from multiple sensors, such as your nose, your eyes, and your ears. Artificial intelligence can only dream of that kind of performance. In the pre-GPS IMU days of photogrammetry, Ground survey data was combined with photographs in an analog form of data fusion. These projects could take as long as 12 months to plan, schedule, fly, and process. In 1985, in what was one of the first uses of airborne LIDAR, NASA flew a Wallops P3 with their Airborne Oceanographic LIDAR, or AOL, up and down Chinticook Bay at 400 feet altitude. The plane was equipped with a Texas Instruments GPS that weighed 53 pounds without the antenna. They used the airplane's INS to determine the orientation of the LIDAR sensor. After a great deal of computation and corrections, they felt they had achieved an accuracy of about 12 centimeters. With a full GPS constellation and better hardware, the team thought they could get it down to a centimeter or two. They were right, but that would have to wait until some 10 years later in the mid 1990s, when the first commercial airborne LIDAR mapping systems began to emerge with truly integrated LIDAR, GPS and INS. By then the GPS satellite constellation had been filled out to where it could be relied on. Direct georeferencing of aerial imagery using GPS-aided INS was first explored in the 1980s and early 90s by researchers at institutes like the University of Calgary. Differential GPS had demonstrated that extremely accurate positions could be computed. So it was only natural that the researchers began thinking that DGPS combined with inertial systems could produce the full exterior orientation for photogrammetry, which was easily extended to LIDAR. Planix launched their first position and orientation system, or PAWS, in 1996. Thanks to Joe Sutton and Ron Roth for their input on this. At the time, Dr. Regal began to shift his focus from single point measurement systems to 2D and 3D laser scanners. In 2004, Regal released the first compact airborne LIDAR scanner with up-to-date pulse rate and full echo signal digitization. So why are we seeing an increase in use of multi-sensor data fusion? Two reasons, better information can be derived from the combined data streams, and it is generally more cost-effective to collect all of the data at one time, time being the operative word. 
In the case of GNSS aided INS, the integration of the two systems produces a position and orientation solution that retains the dynamic or relative accuracy of the INS, but has the absolute accuracy of the GNSS. In the generic case, if the LIDAR sensor is moving while it is collecting data, it can be considered a dynamic or mobile mapping system, as opposed to a static or tripod mounted scanner. Mobile mapping systems can be manned as in a driven vehicle, like an SUV or unmanned as with a drone or UAS. The challenge with any MMS is knowing the position and the orientation of the LIDAR sensor at the time it was fired. This is where GNSS and INS slash IMUs are used to determine the exact position of the sensor as well as the roll, pitch, and yaw. It's incredible when you consider the number of measurements that are taking place every second in one of these systems. There is no doubt that the accurately geo-referenced point cloud, which eventually emerges, is of much greater value than any of the individual measurements. There are two references that I would like to recommend. The first is a detailed text with a complete mathematical treatment of 3D mobile unmanned data collection systems including aerial, ground, and marine. It is mainly focused on airborne, but it even includes nanoscale drones. If you're looking for the complete theory, this is your text. The second is the guidelines for the use of mobile mapping and transportation. I was part of the team that wrote this report for the Transportation Research Board in 2013. This is a practical reference that will allow you to apply the best practices outlined on a daily basis. I'm going to quickly highlight some of the key elements of this report. Perhaps the most valuable aspect of this report is the website that was developed to disseminate the information. LearnMobileLiDAR.com is a tremendous resource for not only vehicle MMS, but a great deal of the information can be applied to all types of mobile mapping. The entire report can be found there, along with a host of other items, such as e-learning modules, state surveying specifications, references, and much more. This is an example of an important diagram from the guide regarding factors affecting the accuracy of a MLS survey and the use of multi-sensor data fusion. This slide represents the core concept of the MLS guidelines. We have a three by three matrix creating nine categories on a continuous scale from low to medium to high for both location accuracy and the density of point coverage for a project of interest. We have termed these DCC or data collection categories. It's important to note that the guidelines are performance-based as opposed to being prescriptive like most, if not all of the other guidelines out there. The responsibility for selecting the methodology required to achieve the desired results is left up to the data collection group. In the end, they have to certify that they have achieved the desired DCC. We have been told a number of times that the guide has been used to explain to management the technical issues involved with mobile LIDAR and how valuable that was to them. This flowchart provides a nice lead in to the next presenter. Rob Dannenberg from Maser Consulting, who is going to explain how they used multi sensor data fusion on two challenging. 3D reality capture projects. But first, let's take care of our second poll. So we'll turn it over to you, Jill. All right, guys, we're gonna open up our second poll, which is what is the most challenging part of a multi-sensor 3D data fusion project? So we would like you to please select consistent field survey control 
data resolution and accuracy issues, data management issues, or 3D modeling. So we'll give you guys about 10 seconds to get in your answers. And from there, we will share the poll results again. So we are gonna go ahead and we're gonna close the poll and share the results. So as you guys can see, we are at 18% for consistent field survey control. We're at 37% for data resolution and accuracy issues, 28% for data management issues, and 17% for 3D modeling. Great. Thank you, Jill. Looks like they're pretty evenly divided on that one. Okay, so we're up to the point where Rob is gonna take control. I'm gonna hand that over to you right now. Thank you, Gene. Um, and thank everyone for attending um, this webinar. Um, so I wanna get started with operationally, uh, where do you start? Um, some of the operational pain points uh, are sometimes clients and clients not understanding what you're trying to collect. So we always start with identifying the data user and we wanna optimize all of our data collections to that end data user, who's gonna be using the data at the end of the day. The next step we take is quality. What is the precision, accuracy, reliability, repeatability, and data security needed? Uh, we basically create our data quality objectives based off those um, assessments. Um, and then we select the best sensors to meet those data quality objectives. Sometimes those sensors can be done with a single sensor. Maybe it's a terrestrial LiDAR scanner. Maybe it's a mobile LiDAR scanner. Maybe it's you know, a different method and we're not using LiDAR. This webinar is gonna be about LiDAR, so we're gonna focus on that going forward. Once we know what sensors are the best to be used to meet these data quality objectives, we wanna understand the optimal conditions for those sensors. So anybody on this webinar that's ever used terrestrial LiDAR or mobile LiDAR or airborne-based LiDAR understands that those sensors have limitations and advantages. And finding out where those advantages are and where those limitations are and the best use case for them is generally where you're gonna decide if you need to use multiple sensors to collect data on a project. From that, we move into safety, and then we move into craft or method. Um, so the initial screening of how we're gonna deploy those sensors. A lot of people on the market say that UAS you know, is, is the great tool. And in reality, that's exactly what it is. It's a tool to put a sensor in a location that you previously might not have been able to get it to. So we decide what's gonna be the best tool to put that sensor in the right location to collect the data that we want. And then for the product, field check procedures for validating data collection, processing of data for the specific use cases, and documenting our workflow. Without documenting the workflow, everywhere from the planning to the field operations to data storage, you can't gather those lessons learned to get better at this and to work with clients to refine workflows moving forward. So we always encourage the user feedback for continuous workflow improvement. So I wanna get started with a project overview. Um, so Maser Consulting was contracted to provide unmanned aerial system mapping of a dam located in the southeast of the United States. This dam is over 100 years old and will undergo reconstruction of the control gates across the top of the 1,000 foot plus or minus wide spillway and improvements at the powerhouse near the gantry crane. The most recent available record drawing documents of the gates and powerhouse were from 1927. To accommodate the construction of the new spillway gates, a detailed 3D survey was needed to be completed for the the design and the process of the completed structure, which has severely restricted access due to safety concerns. With this being a dam, and if you look over to the right side of your screen, you can kind of see the area we were working with, uh, and some large safety concerns. With the length of the dam and the ability to actually be able to set up, we could not just use terrestrial LIDAR scanning to do this, and airborne LIDAR scanning would also have some obstructed and obscured areas due to the density of the um, substation that was attached to the hydroelectric dam. So basically we wanted to work closely with our client um, and the owner of the dam to develop a schedule for a reservoir drawdown, but we didn't want to affect the hydroelectric operations within the system. So doing that, we were able to identify a three-day period where we could draw the water level down 
on a piece of the dam um, low enough to be able to collect that data, which was also going to be needed uh, during the as built. Um, the reservoir drawdown um, allowed us to capture those portions that have not been seen in, in quite a while. The current floodgates on the dam were mechanically operated wooden gates that when the water level got to a certain level, it would tip the wood gate and immediately allow the water to flow through. But that gave no control of the actual operator of the dam to control um, the ability of that water flow. When the water level got high enough, those gates were going to open um, automatically. So we utilized conventional ground survey, terrestrial LIDAR scanning, combined with UAS LIDAR to provide a highly detailed surface and as-built drawings. By integrating both the ground-based and UAS-based LIDAR, we were able to provide an unparalleled mapping detail for the complex survey of this aging critical infrastructure as well as multiple others. Um, in addition, we did a full visual inspection of the dam um, by photo-based UAS. Um, we're not really going to talk about the photo-based UAS inspection during this presentation, but one of the advantages of using multiple sensors is sometimes bringing other things into play, whether that's geophysical sensors or photo sensors, video sensors, you know, to be able to collect um, that holistic data approach. But for right now, we're going to focus on the geospatial aspects. Um, so this combined survey of TLS and UAS LiDAR mapping and the UAS inspection we were able to complete deliverables within five weeks. These de deliverables were able to dramatically accelerate the project schedule for the design and reconstruction, and I'm happy to announce that this actual construction project is fully complete at this point, and those dam gates have done. So our approach was to use multiple sensors and crews to collect all information needed on site. As I mentioned, with the water drawdown and not wanting to affect the hydroelectric capabilities of the dam, we only were going to have three days to collect data. And unlike most traditional survey sites or sites that we would do, there was not going to be an ability to return to the site to collect any missing data. Um, due to weather concerns and other things that actually came up during this three-day window, we were only able to collect LiDAR data over a two-day period which was enough to collect all the data we needed. And with the field quality checks, we ensured all data was collected and that we had redundant data on all services to be able to validate everything. One of the major pain points of combining multiple sensor data, and especially aerial versus ground-based sensors, is the control. Uh, traditionally, airborne LiDAR is controlled with an elevation point, and that's all you're controlling to is to a Z point. Well, when we wanted to merge these data sets together to be able to cover areas that couldn't be seen by the terrestrial LiDAR scanner and the terrestrial LiDAR to cover areas that weren't going to be able to see by the airborne LiDAR scanner, we had the unique challenge of how were we going to be able to control this and be able to merge these projects together. As my Lynn will show you shortly, um, Regal has actually worked uh, with multiple of their clients and within Rye Process Software to actually make this a little more seamless and easy to do. When we did this program um, and this project, that was unavailable. So we had to use unique 3D control targets that could be easily identifiable with all methods of collection. And it could be used as 3D control points to register data sets separately and then bring all the data sets together for final adjustment and registration. Additional control was captured to validate the data. As this was one of the first projects that us here at Mazer Consulting used with airborne LiDAR and terrestrial LiDAR data, we wanted to make sure that all that data was going to be 100% valid. And when we delivered the end product to the client, that we could comfortably sign and seal that as um, a thorough survey uh, to the resolutions and accuracies that they required. Um, so some of the challenges were accuracy requirements. Obviously, doing an as-built on a critical infrastructure project, the accuracy is going to be very high. We knew that terrestrial LIDAR was going to be more than capable of meeting these requirements, and we've had the experience that the UAS was as well. But never bringing those two different data sets together, we were wondering how that data was going to separate. So after controlling and registering the data separately with the VUX LIDAR, which was the airborne LIDAR, and the Regal LIDAR separately, this is the line that we got. Um, as you guys can see on that, the red line on the face of the dam and the blue line perfectly lined up together. And on every other surface and validation, um, it actually came together a lot smoother than we were expecting it to. Um, so the shadowing or obscured areas of the different methods of collecting LIDAR uh, dictated, um, we used both of these to um, ensure fidelity and, and continuity of the data, so we did not have any shadowed or obscured areas by using these different methods. Um, 
the drawdown of the reservoir, um, like I said, was our main limiting factor. And uh, due to the type of operations that they wanted to continue to do on the hydroelectric dam, we needed to fit within that. Using remote sensing technologies and these LiDAR sensors specific, specifically allowed us to collect all of this data in a very rapid amount of time in the field and be able to ensure the accuracy. So at this time, I'd like to show you guys a quick video. For anybody that's ever seen or dealt with LiDAR data, it's really hard to show the density and the fidelity of LiDAR data in a 2D picture. So we've got some video fly-throughs of this data that we just want to show you. So if you can give me one second to get this video started. Okay, so in this video, you can see some different um, things that we did, but here's the overall area to include the construction laydown yard that was going to be used for all the construction. Uh, that we did use multiple cr crews from traditional survey, terrestrial LIDAR, and UAS crews. Some of the GPS equipment we used to control. The Vapor 55 helicopter with a Regal Vux 1 LIDAR on it during setup. And for those of you that have never seen um, a, a helicopter UAS fly, here's just a short video of it taking off and a still shot of it in the air. Now actually flying through the data, um, this data set is um, going to show the combined versions of all the LiDAR data as we fly through that. Again, this is not a photo, this is the actual point cloud that was colorized based off of everything, but you can see the complications that this dam would have caused by any other method. If we use just terrestrial, we weren't going to see the top side of any of this. If we use just airborne, we weren't going to be able to get the detail in that substation. So being able to take all this LiDAR data and the multi-point returns, we were able to create the surface that they needed to be able to design their construction laydown yard and as well as produce everything else. These are some of the safety concerns that we had on the site. Okay. All right, so that was just a short video. Um, now what I'd like to do is actually talk about another project. And this is a project that is starting to be highlighted across the board. And this is using mobile LiDAR scanning, um, truck-mounted mobile LiDAR scanner and a ULS uh, or unmanned LiDAR scanning data fusion. This was uh, State Route 417 in Florida. The two LiDAR scanners that were used was um, a Regal VMX-1HA and a Regal VUX-1. Okay, the project. Uh, basically, they wanted to widen this controlled access highway uh, to the inside median. All work that needed to be conducted was going to be within the right-of-way. It was 38 lane miles of limited access highway. Ten bridges were affected over 100 acres of additional assets and resources of the client needed to be mapped off of the roadway, and there was an 18-month design schedule. Anybody that's worked with a DOT or um, a highway entity understands that an 18-month design schedule for a 38-line-mile limited access highway is very tight, and that was actually one of the large challenges on this. So why use multi-sensor data fusion? Other methods and scanners we're not going to meet the client's expectations. Combination of survey, mobile LiDAR, and UAS uh, drone LiDAR is what was done. And we needed to provide the design team with a pavement survey for 15% line and grade within three weeks. Again, anyone working in the survey um, area would know that to be able to do a 38 uh, lane mile highway area and 100 acres of offsite for design grade survey provided in three weeks is very hard. Um, we were actually able to do this, not only complete the data and deliver within three weeks, we were able to do it at a 40% cost reduction from traditional methods. Some of the key benefits were safety. It was reduced man hours near or on the roadway. One of the things we did not need to do on this expressway was close the lanes. We never closed the roads, we never blocked off a lane, and we never needed to physically access the road surface outside of driving the mobile ladder on it. Um, Coverage, we had no need to access the private property that surrounded this area. Um, that can come with its own complications. And the detail, we needed to be able to make sure that we had the topography, the bridges, and the full pavement DTM. 
Now, not due to technology limitations, but due to regulatory limitations, this project actually created some additional challenges. So um, anybody that's familiar with this um, route right here, it is actually right off the approach runway for Orlando International Airport, which was going to be a challenge to use UAS there, but we were able uh, to work through the system, decide safe flying heights, um, and make sure we were in regulatory compliance. One of the other regulatory restrictions with UAS is actually flying over unprotected people. What a lot of people don't realize and understand about that is that's also flying over moving vehicles. Obviously, you don't want to cause a distraction to drivers, and you don't uh, want, you know, in an instance of, of an accident happening, you wouldn't want to crash into a moving vehicle that could cause, um, obviously, further injuries. So what we did was actually use the mobile LIDAR for all the road surfaces, never flying the UAS over the road surfaces or to have to close that and to be able to collect this data. One of the limitations of mobile LIDAR is it does a very good job collecting the road surfaces, um, the underbridge data and all of that, but due to shadowing and the way that this was lined out, as you can see here, all these black areas were going to be shadowed out and not be able to be seen by a mobile LIDAR scanner, but those were also critical areas for the survey. So we used UAS for all off-pavement collection to be able to collect that. And people always ask, what is the accuracy that you can get from these and validated? So this was uh, Central Florida Expressway's first time authorizing a UAS LIDAR-based flight. And they're very familiar with airborne LIDAR. And traditional airborne LIDAR doesn't generally meet the DOT spec for doing paving analysis and those kind of things. Um, so they authorized us to do this, but required a secondary firm to come in and independently validate the control. Through those independent cross sections that were completed by another firm, we had a tenth of a foot average between roadway and off pavement. On the roadway, we were sitting at five hundredths of an inch. Um, which easily met their spec of what they needed, and off pavement was two tenths. Part of that two tenths is because of the vegetation uh, that's there. Also, the point density. Uh, the mobile LIDAR alone was collecting 1,890 points per square meter, and the UAS LIDAR was collecting 650 points per square meter. This added density of data, and the way that we ended up flying and designing the process of doing it, um, increase the density from maybe what was needed, but the redundant data was going to give us the validation and the ease of um, merging these data sets. And Mylin will be showing you shortly on how um, Rye Process can be used to bring these two data sets together and actually register them down. So besides using these to actually meet the three-week design schedule, there were so several, other, several other added benefits using multiple sensor data fusion. Um, design decision support. If anybody's ever worked um, as an initial survey for designers, additional requests are going to come from multiple designers after the fact. Maybe they're going to find out something about whatever the site is that they didn't currently know, and now they're going to have to adjust their design that might change, you know, survey scopes and that. So as the project developed, so did requests for additional information. We were able to efficiently handle these with the approach by just doing additional LIDAR extraction. Collecting in the way we did, we had so much additional data in different areas that were not required in the additional scope when they came back with these change orders and said, hey, we need this, or we need this, or we need that. We were able to just take the original LIDAR data set that was already registered, locked down to control, and actually do that uh, final extraction for them to be able to get those added requests done efficiently and cost effectively without having to return to the field. Data merging in SS4 to develop planometrics and TINs for requests. We also were able to leverage the LiDAR data for detailed bridge modeling without having to return to the field. Anyone that works in the field knows that can be one of your biggest cost points is sending those crews to the field. So at this time, I'm going to hand back over to Gene. Uh, I would be happy to address any questions that come up during the question and answer sections, and Mylin will be giving the next um, section. Thank you again. Very good, Rob. Thank you very much. And I think at this point, we're ready for my Lynn. So I'm going to transfer control to you, my Lynn.
Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Jean, for the introduction. Thank you, Rob, for a very detailed overview of a pretty, pretty significant project, basically, in my backyard here in Orlando, Florida. Um, so what we have here is a pr project. which here we go um, so on the left side is our mobile lidar project and the right side is our uas or uls uh, project over the same area this is that 417 project that rob just went through um, as the mobile project has one mission with two scan records going eastbound and westbound whereas the uls project has three flights or lifts. Um, these are actually from a much larger collection, uh, but for the purpose of this video, video, we're just highlighting three of those lifts. As the ULS project is larger in size with overall more data files, it just makes sense in this situation to use that as our master project. We're gonna merge in the mobile LiDAR project uh, into this project structure since it just has less files to import in. Here we're using our project merge wizard utility inside RIPE process. And uh, I just want to note that before merging the project, we really recommend to ensure that the data is already registered properly to ground control. Uh, in this case, as Rob mentioned, both the MLS and ULS data were previously captured, collected, post-processed separately, and registered to control uh, using RIPE Precision, which is Regal's automated algorithm using common features, the accuracy of um, the trajectory information and of the LIDAR itself to tightly knit uh, the data together. Um, I do want to mention that it is also possible to merge these projects together. I'm just going to pause this screen right here. Um, it is possible to merge your projects together after initial collection and then ultimately just process directly from scratch all together and register the two data sets together from the very beginning. Um, and everything is already merged in this project here, but I just want to pause and showcase as the default settings were already enabled. Unfortunately, some of these settings were not shown. So what I here, have here is actually pausing the screen and these are the options that you're able to select using the project merge wizard. Uh, we have the ability to, uh, with regards to devices, we're able to clone the device or merge them. And what we call a device is either the laser scanner, the INS GPS, so your IMU information, your trajectory information, as well as your cameras. Uh, the default setting is to merge. And by merging, uh, it really makes sense because you have information from multiple different uh, sensors. Not merging, cloning. When you merge, it only makes sense if you're merging multiple projects captured from the very same sensor, which was the case with our UAV data, um, those three different lifts, as I mentioned. Uh, with regards to data files, we bring those in, and then after they're imported in, then uh, they have that MLS file header in front of it. So after that imports in, we're able to open up a view window, drag and drop the information, and we've done a scaled reflectance in grayscale. Now, unfortunately, the geographical systems database manager for the data, just we're not on the same scale for the UAV and the, the mobile. So we're just going to rerun RI world. This will update the georeferencing for the mobile data since that mobile data was imported into our UAV data, just to update and ensure that both data sets are on the same projection to be able to display properly in the view window. Um, and with that, we're just running that in the background, uh, just know that you have a few different options during that project merge. Um, I didn't have a chance to mention as the video was going through, but uh, so not only cloning your devices, bringing in your data files into the physical master project structure, you're able to 
physically move those previously processed files, or you can make a copy, which was actually showcased here in this video. Uh, just be prepared that if you do select to copy the files into your master project, the overall master project folder will, of course, increase in size and take more space on your hard drive. So just take a note when you're going through that workflow. So after the data has updated and processed through, we've just opened up the same view window as before. And uh, we're going to drag and drop in the rest of the flight lines. Um, and we're specifically highlighting the area of two overlapping areas. Uh, so that way you can ensure that the project was merged properly. And you can see that it seems to be lining up relatively. We do want to ensure that it is lining up on an absolute scale. So we're going to drag and drop in our control files. So here you can see that they're populated. And then toggling over to our 3D window, you can just zoom in and we can identify the mobile targets. You can see that it's right on the money. And as we've imported all of our files, we do actually have the, the mobile camera triggering uh, spot. So we're just going to hide that just to, for ease of viewing here. And just reorienting ourselves in the data, we can find an air, another area of interest um, to view a little bit more in depth, like an overpass here. So we'll just get a better look perspective here. There we go. Right on the overpass, we can see how everything is really lining up. Zooming in on another control, you can see we're right on the money there. And we have the option of bringing even more information into the view window. It's very easy. Everything is just drag and drop. So with that, we can even bring in our trajectory paths. Have that pop up. There we go. And we can see where the northbound and east or north and southbound and east and westbound of this overpass just to get a better orientation so this is just one of the many now had we already colorized the data we could change our view type to to even display the previously processed data in a uh, to display the additional RGB data attribute, um, but really that's just how easy it is to fuse real data that's captured from different platforms. Um, from here, just you can go forward and export your data files into LAS, and then you're able to import those files into your favorite third-party feature extraction software for your further analytics. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Gene. Very good. That's very impressive, Mylin. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. So we're drawing toward the end. Um, before we get to your questions, here are our key takeaways for today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Multi sensor data fusion is rapidly becoming the norm when it comes to 3D data capture, with even most tripod scanners today having a camera built in. The Transportation Research Board Mobile LiDAR Guidelines are a valuable resource, which can be found at the learnmobilelidar.com website. Controlling the data appropriately will simplify the merging of that data. Be sure to understand the capabilities and limitations of your equipment before starting your project. And with Regal, Integrated LiDAR systems and software data fusion is easily accomplished. I'd like to put a little plug in for uh, joining the Younger Geospatial Professionals Group on LinkedIn. Regardless of your age, we need the full range of participation. This is really the future of our profession. 
So I want to thank Rob, Mylin, and Jill. Before we begin the questions and answers, could we, we would like to thank everyone for attending this LIDAR News educational webinar on multi-sensor data fusion. If you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to contact us via the email addresses on this slide. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey about our presentation. We would really appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. So Jill, let's take our first question. All right, so the first question is going to be for Rob, which is how did you perform the accuracy assessment and how did you align the data? Okay, so um, this has actually evolved over the last several years uh, from that project that we showed you guys on that dam uh, versus the highway project. But I think um, one that question came up before my lens demonstration, but she actually showed um, a very effective way of how um, the data can be aligned directly together using that software suite. Um, but the accuracy assessment was done the same way that any traditional survey accuracy assessment was done. Yes, we had solid gr uh, ground control points that we um, put down and actually used to register and adjust the data to, but then we also had multiple checkpoints that were blind to that data processing group that were they were unable to be used for um, data registration and everything, and all the data was validated to those checkpoints, um, basically other survey points in the field that, that were not um, accessible to the data uh, processing uh, personnel to actually do an accuracy assessment. In addition to that, uh, specifically on the highway project, an independent surveyor came in did their own cross sections across the highway and everything and compared their results um, to our results and they did an, an independent evaluation of the data and we're seeing the exact same accuracies uh, we were seeing. Um, as a reminder, some of those accuracies I showed you on the highway, those were combined accuracies between the UAS um, and the mobile LIDAR scanning. Um, I do have those available separately um, that we could discuss, probably not the right form to do that right here. Um, and then how the data was aligned early on before we were able to use Regal software to do that. Again, having those control points, which my lens showed perfectly um, in her demonstration. If you guys zoomed in, you guys saw the um, basically checkerboard pattern that um, actually had the uh, control points lining up perfectly to them. Um, our airborne LiDAR data is dense enough that we're able to see those targets as well and actually identify the center point of those targets and control everything to that. That's a method we've been using for a long time or creating a 3D style target so we could create planes to find that center point. So not only are we correcting data by elevation, but if there's any minor X and Y um, uh, shifting of the data, uh, we can pull all that data directly to a control point. Very good, thank you, Rob. Thank you. Something else, Jill? Yep, I'm just trying to go through the questions at the moment. Um, Rob, uh, what approximate altitude were the flights taken at? Okay, so the flights for the dam were taken about 350 feet. Um, we were unable to do that for the highway due to the proximity to Orlando Airport uh, and the runway and everything. So the airborne LIDAR data for, um, that depending where we were um, on the highway because we actually started to open up and, and get out the, some of that controlled airspace <coughs> we're sorry about that we're as low as 75 feet and for consistency of data we wanted to keep everything relatively close so as we could get up higher than that we did get up to about 150 feet even though we could uh, fly higher than that for consistency of data we wanted to keep everything within about a hundred foot range of each other so between 75 and 175 feet is where the altitude for that highway project was collected excellent rob what percentage of your projects would you say are involving data fusion well using multiple different lidar sensors Probably yeah. about 25 to 30 percent um, of our projects are starting to use them, but almost every project we do that are UAS based becomes a data fusion project because we are using other sensors um, 
either to colorize point clouds or to do photo based um, stuff that that's not necessarily lidar, but it's using multiple sensors um, to to fuse that data together as well. So at that point, probably closer to ninety percent, but using mobile terrestrial versus airborne is probably twenty five, and it's I would not be surprised if it, we hit that forty percent threshold in this in this next year. Excellent. Okay, um, what software are you using to colorize the point cloud? So. so when we're doing dual collect, um, I'll, I'll answer that real quick and Mylan might want to chime in on this. Um, when we are using, um, when we are collecting imagery at the exact same time that we're doing Regal, whether that be mobile, terrestrial, um, or airborne, uh, we can just use Regal software directly to colorize the point cloud. Um, that's part of right process and everything that can be done. Occasionally, um, our flights or our operations demand that we actually collect um, separately from the LIDAR for whatever reason that might be. And in that case, we tend to use some, some other softwares um, that, again, this probably not the best audience uh, to talk about that with, but if you reach out to me directly, I'll go ahead and, and share those. Um, like types of softwares with everyone. My Absolutely. Win. Yep. <laughs> I'll chime in. Uh, continue. So as Rob mentioned, yes, it is possible to colorize a point cloud within the Rye Process software suite, and that is primarily because the camera imagery is co-captured with the LiDAR. The common denominator is that same INS GPS device. They have the same camera trigger and timestamp, and so that information is fed into the uh, camera data wizard and the uh, uh, data colorization wizard, or maybe that's not the exact name, but insert some some terminology plus wizard in front of it that is a module embedded inside the rye process software suite that is for the full kinematic uh, suite of regal hardware uh, for data processing and so that is the common denominator to be able to do the colorization uh, through regal sensors I do believe that there was a question regarding how to colorize data from or doing data fusion from other brands of, of LiDAR sensors. There are other softwares, as Rob mentioned, with regards to that, uh, but with uh, the benefit of using fusing data from Regal sensors is that they all have the same uh, raw database file. Uh, the same same information, so we're able to bring it all into the same software to to, to merge it all together. Excellent, thank you. Anything else, Jill? Yes, we definitely have some more questions um, that some of them may end up needing to be answered off air, just because they're a little bit more in depth. Um, Sure. Rob, was, was there a camera mounted to the drone and were there multiple cameras used for these data collects? Uh, during the dam, we actually did the, all the photo flights independently from the LiDAR flights. Um, one of the things that we run into, and especially with UAS, uh, is we can collect, we can dual collect uh, camera and LiDAR data, but we, again, like to put the sensor in its best orientation of to collect the best level of data. And generally, when we're collecting LiDAR data, the parameters that we want to collect the LiDAR data and the parameters we want to collect the photo data from a UAS don't always align with each other. So in those cases, we actually do separate flights, um, sometimes with separate UAVs, um, to collect all our LiDAR data and collect all our photo data separately. Um, during the um, highway project that um, I gave you the example of, we actually did no um, airborne photo collection. We didn't uh, need it for uh, what the client was asking for and everything. Um, so uh, all the colorization, um, which I'm not actually sure we showed any of it, was collected from the mobile LiDAR system, which was dual collecting uh, camera uh, data and LiDAR at the same time for the actual road surfaces or, uh, or under bridge, but for the off pavement where we were really focusing the UAS on, the imagery was not uh, needed or a requirement for this. Very good. Well, I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Uh, 
Uh, Rob, do you have a rough rule of thumb minimum accuracy when capturing GCPs? Um, I don't know if I fully understand the question. Um, like, do we want a GCP to be a specific accuracy? Uh, if we can get clarification on that. Um, Maser Consulting being a multidiscipline engineering and a survey firm is all our control is always set by our survey crews. Uh, now some of uh, the UAS staff are also, you know, survey crew chiefs. Uh, so, so we kind of can double dip that uh, with what we're doing. But um, I, I guess I, I'm not sure what the question is because once we have a, a GCP and it's set to um, by survey crew chief, I expect the LIDAR data to line directly up to it. Um, now checkpoints and everything else, depending on what the accuracy requirements are for the client. And Gene had the uh, perfect slide um, about um, the different accuracy classes and those kind of things. Is that that's where it needs to line up? But our experience with the Regal Vux, the IMU we're using, and everything we're using, uh, we're always within about three inches of that control prior to registration. Once we register, we're you know. You know, generally um, eight hundreds is about uh, our our highest um, that we we kind of find acceptable on hard surfaces, and then in vegetated areas that that can drift from that uh, a little bit, but it's all within national mapping standards. Yeah. Okay, let's take one more, and then we'll wrap it up within the hour. Okay, I have one more for my Lynn, which is, do you ever use cloud to cloud registration algorithms for tightening up one data set to another, for example, registering a UAV point cloud to a terrestrial laser scan cloud? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, the RIE process software suite is for our kinematic based systems. Uh, so if it's any of their airborne, uh, mobile vehicle or UAS LIDAR with regards to terrestrial laser scanning, we do have a separate software package called RiceScan Pro. Um, now currently internally we are working on finalizing and releasing what we're calling RIDB 2.0 and that stands for Regal Database. Uh, this 2.0 file structure will bridge the gap between all of Regal's uh, sensor portfolios, regardless of its acquisition method, having that same internal database structure will allow for even easier data merging, regardless of the sensor package. We're gonna be able to marry terrestrial with UAS, we're able to marry mobile with Airborne, um, whatever configuration you want, we're gonna be able to marry it all together because of that common uh, database structure. And Mylin, I just want to add one thing to that real quick. Um, we use Regal software for that, and sometimes not for the exact application you're asking for, like uh, registering airborne to a terrestrial LiDAR cloud. Um, that, that is possible right now, but like Mylin said, that uh, DB 2.0 will help with that. But um, sometimes we will hold a mobile LiDAR data set and register the UAS LiDAR data set to that. We absolutely use Regal software for that. And other times, uh, sometimes we'll collect a data set, uh, then a client will come back and say, I need an additional area. Well, we've already done mapping and everything from the original data set we collected. So sometimes we will register um, a later data set to the early data set from everything that's already been mapped and holding that you know, standard so that doesn't shift at all and only the new data can be pulled into that. Um, but Regal Software is absolutely capable of that. Absolutely, that's uh, actually the RIE Precision algorithm that I had mentioned during the video. Uh, you have the ability to reference previously registered data, so it's positional information, you use that to refer back to um, and use that as a more or less control aspect. Uh, very easy to, to make use of. Great. So we're pretty much out of time. On behalf of Regal, Maser Consulting, and LiDAR News, we want to thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Please let us know what you think of the webinar by filling out the short survey.